palaces, the most spectacular and lavish homes on earth. Luxuriously designed for the royals who wanted the biggest and the best. Behind the golden gates of these royal megastructures are incredible stories waiting to be discovered. Infamous monarchs from history and the artists, designers and engineers who turned their grand visions into a reality. These are the most opulent, flamboyant and innovative royal residences around the world. This time, Palesh Castle in Sanaya, Romania, is a magical palace full of contradictions. Although it looks medieval, the Victorian era castle was built to include all the latest technology. Palesh is more than just a building. It symbolizes the birth of a new European nation, making it one of the world's greatest palaces. Palesh Castle is a fantastical masterpiece that took 40 years to create. Romania's first monarch, King Carol I, filled it with secret treasures and secret passages. Against the odds, Palesh has survived war and revolution. The story of the castle is the story of Romania itself. His Royal Highness, Prince Radu, is married to Margareta of Romania, the head of the royal family. Prince Radu has written a book about the history of Palesh Castle, which was built for King Carol I at the end of the 19th century. One of the reasons it's so intriguing, the place, is because it's the result of huge contrasts. It looks very classic and it's very young. I mean, the first stone was laid in 1875, so there is no way to compare that with the castles in France, in Germany, or in Britain, or even in Russia. But uh, the whole thing looks very classic simply because he did not want a fantasy. He wanted just something to fill up the gap that Romania was obliged to face as developing a little bit later than the Western world. As well as being aesthetically pleasing, the palace was technologically well ahead of its time. Another thing to say about Pelish is that it benefited from the most extraordinary technological inventions of the time. Uh, having electricity in early 1880s, having all sorts of inventions in the construction itself, uh, materials, machines, and also the fact that it reflected mostly his uh, state aspirations than private tastes. At the turn of the 20th century, when other palaces in Europe were relying on traditional maintenance methods, Palesh was in a league of its own. This machine, built in 1900, is a massive vacuum cleaner system for the whole castle. The building didn't only include electricity, which was remarkable for the time, but it also included an inbuilt vacuum system with a pump installed in the basement, which when turned on, would produce vacuums in tubes distributed all over the building into which you would plug the nozzle of a vacuum cleaner locally and thus you could clean the floors and carpets of the building. And remarkably, as these systems were notorious for breaking down, this one worked extremely well. In fact, the large-scale vacuum cleaner is still in working order today. Dana Wojcescu has taken time out from her role as head of public relations at Pelesh to demonstrate. Deosebit de silențios și eficient, sistemul este foarte modern în zilele noastre, pentru că tot zgomotul și toată activitatea care generează acest sistem se află la subsol, în așa numita cameră a aspiratorului. Acolo se află motorul electric, cele două pompe de vid care creează vacuum în aceste prize de aer 
și vasele pentru colectarea prafului din aerul aspirat. The vacuum pumps are connected to scores of intake sockets dotted around the castle. Acest tub este branșat la priza de aer din perete, iar funcționarea se activează de la acest buton, asigurându-se astfel curățarea spațiilor pe suprafețe largi și distanțe mari. Aceste prize de aer se află la fiecare colț al acestui spațiu, al coridoarelor, iar tuburile folosite sunt de lungime mare pentru a asigura întreaga suprafață. I love the idea that you don't have to carry a big piece of machinery around with you and you can just walk around with your little attachment and a tube and you could hoover anywhere you liked. It was groundbreaking technology in a country that hadn't even existed 50 years before it was installed. In the mid 19th century, the map of mainland Europe looked very different. Three mighty imperial states dominated the landscape. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. Sandwiched between these mega powers were the provinces of Moldavia and Wallachia. From them, a new country emerged. Modern Romania was born in 1859 with the uniting of two principalities, Moldavia and Wallachia, and they'd been part of the Ottoman Empire. But in 1877, Romania gained independence as an independent state from the Ottoman Empire. This brand new country was in need of a ruler. The new Romanians wanted a king as ruler, but he had to be someone of royal blood, and that meant he had to be someone from outside the country. There were various candidates considered, but in the end, Napoleon III of France suggested Carol, a German prince. Carol was a military man who soon came to dislike the more informal traditions of his new home. He was shocked by the cultural differences between his uh, childhood areas and Romania. It is said that the first gift he gave to the politicians close to him was a watch, because they were never on time. It was shocking also for the Romanian aristocrats to face suddenly a cold king who was not open to their gossipies and influences and uh, interest. And it is said, for example, that he didn't like to fully shake the hand with anybody. He was offering one, two, three, maximum four fingers, depends on the level of interest or the closeness you had with the prince. Carol was cold, but well-connected. The world's most famous monarch thought highly of the young ruler. There are letters from Queen Victoria giving him an, a hugely great esteem and, and admiration. Some of the letters of Queen Victoria are completely touching. You can hardly recognize her because she's, she's really enthusiastic about this young head of state. The young Carol had no intention of being a mere puppet king. He wanted to forge the country in his own image. Carol was not the first choice. Indeed, he was quite far down the list of candidates, but he turned out to be an excellent choice as king. He was devoted to the job. He was determined to be a good king. And his wife actually said that he wore the crown in his sleep. When uh, Prince Carol came, he came with a plan. He came uh, with a plan to transform this little principality in a modern European state. One of Carol's priorities was to build himself a palace, a grand residence where he could spend the summer. In the late 1860s, Carol made frequent visits to a monastery near the village of Sanaya and fell in love with the area. Carol wrote to his father after a stay in Sanaya, staying in this place is good for us, and with each day that passes, my desire to build a summer residence grows even stronger. 
So he immediately started to build the castle, not that much for his own comfort, because he was a very severe person with himself and with the others, but uh, to host uh, what was so important in those times to host, which was the state occasions, and to show to the monarchs, heads of state of the empires around, that Romania matters. It's important to understand that it was a statement, a statement the new king, the new uh, ruler of Romania, made in front of Europe, in front of the Ottoman Empire, and not less important, in front of the Romanian people. A royal residence was a daunting commission for any architect. In 1872, the first king of Romania, Carol, chose one of the finest in Europe. The respected German architect, Wilhelm von Dodderer, Work began on what would soon be known as Pelesh Castle in late 1873. But Dodderer and his men soon encountered a major problem. Once they designed the building, they started to set out the foundations, which turned out to be much more problematic than hoped. There was an unusually high rainfall, and as they began to excavate the foundations, the site deteriorated into mudslides. Today, we see a very nice open area, which strikes the visitor from the very beginning. But the time when the area was discovered, of course, it was a swamp, it was a forest. In order to get to the less saturated or wet soils at the top, the workers dug down much deeper into the rocky subsoil to try and find a much stronger base to place these foundations. The problem with this, however, was that in that digging, they managed to unearth a number of really powerful natural springs. And these springs, in turn, started gushing out and making the layers of soil wash away. And what they had to do was to intercept these springs, direct the water elsewhere into channels that they made, allow the land to dry out a bit, and then they could go in and put the foundations. Architect Dodera used a new method of construction when building the castle's five-meter-deep foundations. Traditional foundations had merely been trenches built into the earth and filled with stone or brick. Concrete foundations had advantages in that you could shape them to fit the landscape and you could reinforce them to take a much higher stresses. In August 1875, King Carol finally laid the foundation stone of his new palace. He declared a hope that this place become the cradle of our country's dynasty. But the foundation work alone had eaten up half of the king's budget. So in 1876, the king sacked his architect, Wilhelm von Dodera, and replaced him with his assistant, Johannes Schultz. from Lemberg, modern-day Lviv in the Ukraine, and he was also very ambitious, and he created the initial plans for the castle's construction from 1875 to 1883. He provided a beautiful design, which is also quite cost-effective. Carol and Schultz employed scores of Romanian carpenters and masons, but also craftsmen from abroad. This was to be an international collaboration. At any one time, you could hear 14 different languages, 14 different types of national dress. It was this sort of incredible melting pot of different nationalities. The palace that these workers were creating would not have been out of place in medieval Europe. The choice of a medieval-style building is very deliberate to say something about what they thought a palace should be. It should hark back to an earlier era. It should point to a continuing culture, a culture of knights and chivalry. Although stylistically the building looked to the past, modern techniques and materials made Pelesh easier to build than a medieval castle. Not only could they use the traditional materials of stone, and brick and timber, and these are obvious from the castle facade, but they could also use steel and concrete which had just come in as major building materials in the previous decades. With steel and concrete, 
you could make much bigger spans. You didn't have to worry so much about the shape of the things you were building. You knew you could achieve them. After almost a decade of construction, the castle was finally finished. The moment when the palace castle was open, which uh, was in the autumn of 1883, was again a statement created by the king. It was a huge ceremony here at the castle. Politicians were brought from Bucharest, diplomats, special guests were invited. There were organized festivities here uh, in Sinaya. I will describe Palace Castle as a wonder in the middle of a beautiful area in the mountains, as a dream of the first king of Romania to create a modern residence and to impose himself as the first king of a new independent country. The palace was an extraordinary mix of styles, both outside and in. The interior style of the spaces is as extravagant and fantasy-driven as the exterior, everything designed to attract the attention and impress the visitor. The place is hectic, has a lot of styles, and uh, especially in furniture, in, uh, in the collection of fine arts and uh, porcelains and all that. An interior designer would be unhappy. The distinctive look of Palesh Castle is no accident. King Carol had decided how he wanted his palace to look many years in advance. Înainte de venirea în România, regele Carol întreprinde foarte multe călătorii de studiu, atât în Europa, în marile orașe culturale europene, cât și în spații exotice precum Asia sau Nordul Africii. La fel procedează și în cazul arhitecților și decoratorilor pe care îi angajează. Aceștia sunt trimiși în călătorii de studiu și de cercetare, motiv pentru care mare parte din interioarele de la Castelul Peleș sunt inspirate din interioare aflate în reședințe europene consacrate. One of the classic examples of outside inspiration is the Arab-influenced Moorish room, built in the early 1890s. Destinată ceremoniilor oficiale, sala aceasta a fost inspirată din decorația palatelor uh, Alhambra, Spania. There is also a Turkish room, a reminder of the influence on Romania from its large neighbor to the south, the Ottoman Empire. There was no residence, and if we look, for example, in the castles in France, without a little Turkish room. In the case of the Palace Castle, we have both this Moorish and Turkish. And they were area also of relaxation, of calm. Oriental culture was also part of the Romanian culture, so creating a German style, let's say, a palace, I think this was a little touch to connect it with the Romanian society and traditional culture, I would say. The new castle soon became one of King Carol's favorite homes and that of his queen, Elizabeth. Trebuie să spunem că Peleșul a funcționat ca reședință regală de vară a cuplului Carol Elisabeta. Regele obișnuia să vină la Sinaia însoțit de întreaga curte. Uh, trebuie să spunem că demnitarii, uh, miniștrii, soțiile acestora care aveau propriile lor locuințe la Sinaia se deplasau aici. Sinaia devenind a doua capitală a României, un loc de vilegiatură uh, foarte important, uh, tocmai datorită amplasării aici a reședinței de vară. So it was really the headquarter of the monarchy for usually, let's say, six months per year. During the summer months, the king and queen could enjoy one of architect Johannes Schulz's finest creations, the Royal Library. Completed in 1883, it was a way for Carol to show off his breadth of interests. Sala adăpostește 700 de titluri din colecția regală, care număra peste 30.000 de volume, cărți de beletristică, de istorie, de artă, 
de artă militară, cărți de medicină și, bineînțeles, cărți religioase. But in the library, all is not what it seems. A secret passageway that is no longer accessible kept the king separate from his subjects. Al doilea raft este ușa secretă. Aici nu sunt cărți, ci doar coperte de cărți. Ușa se deschidea pe vremea regelui Carol I prin apăsarea acestui buton în interior. În spatele ușii, regele Carol adăpostea seiful său, dar totodată exista o scară în spirală ce comunica la etajul întâi al castelului Peleș în apartamentul regal. Pelish Castle has a number of secret passageways and these were built into the castle um, basically so that the king didn't have to bump into people he didn't want to meet. I think the fact that they thought about it and they knew that they wanted those secret passageways incorporated into the design right from the beginning would have made it structurally much, much easier to build in. It soon became clear that Pelish Castle was too small for the king and his court. The task of expanding the castle in 1893 was given to the Czech-born architect, Carol Lehman. He was a very, very talented man who actually devoted the whole of his life to the royal family. Lehman would do his best to turn Carol's architectural dreams into reality. Almost every day, the two would meet in Lehman's office on site to discuss their plans for Pelesh. Liman nu doar că mărește suprafața la sola castelului Peleș prin adăugarea unor camere, dar redecorează interioare, înalță turnul principal al castelului cu un etaj și unește corpurile celor două clădiri din care se compunea inițial castelul Peleș, aripa adjutanților și partea de castel propriu-zisă. King Carol's wife, Queen Elizabeth was a poet and a writer. For her, Pelesh needed to have culture at its heart. The result is one of the finest examples of Carol Lehman's work. On the first floor in Pelesh is a rather marvelous concert hall, which is influenced by the Renaissance style of the English country house, Hatfield House. It's got the same paneling as Hatfield House, but also what's great is that the French artist Le Comte de Nuit, he did a portrait of Queen Elizabeth, so she looks down onto the concert audience. The concert hall is still used to this day to host jazz and classical performances. When Pelesh Castle was built in the late 19th century, King Carol I insisted that it was equipped with the latest technology so it could function efficiently. Pelesh may look like something from the Middle Ages, but in its day, it was a thoroughly modern palace. I was looking today to, to the castle and I realized that it expressed very much the personality of Carol, at the same time very much connected to history, to old fashion, but also very open to modernity. And uh, I think this parts are visible definitely inside the castle. One room, above all, represents King Carol's ambition. It is a main reception room known as the Hall of Honor. Fără îndoială, regele Carol a pus în castelul Peleș și în decorația interioară o parte din sufletul său, holul de onoare de pildă, prin întreaga decorație, vorbește despre originile sale germane, prin galeria de strămoși și prin statuile care reprezintă strămoși. The main hall is in many respects the most symbolic part of the house. It is the place where he and everyone else until us receive the most important guests. Capetele încoronate ale Europei erau invitate aici la castel să participe la recepții, să participe la partide de vânătoare și la plimbări pe munte. Întotdeauna sobru, drept, îmbrăcat în uniformă militară, el își aștepta oaspeții în mijlocul sălii. The Hall of Honor contained a high-tech surprise for Carol's distinguished guests. 
When they were ready, he would show them the heavens. One of the really lovely features about the Hall of Honours is that they don't have conventional windows around the room. So instead, what they've done is to create this glass ceiling over a part of the room. And this glass ceiling is quite stunning. So when you look up, you see a layer of stained glass. But in fact, above the layer of stained glass is another glass ceiling as well. Now, these are actually retractable. So initially, you would manually winch it open so you could open up the stained glass layer, let more light in, and then you could even open up the second layer of glass. And what that did was open up the room to the elements so you could get nice fresh air. And eventually they changed that opening system to being run by an electrical motor. There was no practical purpose to the retractable glass ceiling. It was merely an item for show. Mysteriously, a ceiling could retract to show you the real sky. No doubt the awe of the guests assembled below. The reason I think that they actually had the two layers of glass is that the outer layer of glass was the load-bearing glass, the structural glass, the thing that would actually take the weight of the pounding rain or the snow or any other weather elements that affected it because the stained glass itself, being more of a piece of art, wouldn't have been able to withstand the weather in the same way. The retractable roof is just one example of many modern technologies deliberately put into the building. This was a very early building with electricity, and the electricity not only enabled the roof, but was also used for the lighting. King Carroll's enterprising engineers used a natural resource to provide the castle's electricity. Apa pârâului Peleș izvorăște din apropierea castelului Peleș, din munți. Este o apă pură, clară și, datorită diferenței de nivel, de altitudine, ea capătă putere venind la vale cu o forță puternică. Însă a fost necesară regularizarea și crearea manuală a acestor cascade pentru a asigura presiunea necesară de funcționare a turbinelor. The power plant was designed to complement the architecture of the other buildings in the area. It also had another practical function. Its first floor had accommodation for less important guests at the castle. The power plant was built in 1884 with the assistance of engineers from Austria. Over 130 years later, it's still going strong. Aici puteți vedea turbinele originale și sistemul original de funcționare. Centrala mai funcționează Sigur că au rămas numai două grupuri funcționale și ea este racordată la sistemul național de asigurare a curentului electric. Ea reprezintă, pe de o parte, o dovadă a istoriei tehnicității în România și, totodată, o dovadă a valorificării a tot ceea ce regele Carol I a adus în România. In order to ensure the turbines worked efficiently and to keep water flowing at a consistent speed, a balancing tank was built. A valve stops water from flowing too quickly into the turbines. The backwash created flows up into the balancing tank, which equalizes the pressure before releasing the water gently back into the system. The electricity the power plant produced achieved spectacular results. The effect of the lighting uh, both inside and outside the castle was so extraordinary that uh, visitors said that the castle looks like a Christmas tree. And there was an innovative way of staying warm during the cold winter months. Heat was provided by a central heating system that sent hot air to vents in the floors and walls of the palace. Not only did it include electricity, it also included central heating. 
which doesn't sound particularly remarkable today, but was very unusual at the late 19th century, most houses not installing central heating until the middle of the 20th century. The central heating consisted of a boiler, which was coal-fired in the basement, which was used to heat water and air. The air was fed through ducts through the walls and the floors and the ceilings, and then into the rooms. But the boiler was also used to heat water, which was then fed through pipes to more conventional radiators. Pelesh Castle's revolutionary heating system provided warmth for over 40 rooms. Some of the fireplaces did generate heat, just not in the conventional way. So they actually created these fake fireplaces, which then had a bit of a cover, and then behind the cover sat the radiator. So it sort of looked like the heat was coming out of a fireplace, whereas actually it was some super modern technology that was doing the job. In amongst the modern technology, there was still space to celebrate the traditional. The grandest of the palace's guest suites was built for the visit of a very special dignitary, one of the most powerful men in Europe. Ne aflăm aici în apartamentul imperial, cel mai mare apartament de oaspeți al castelului Peleș, amenajat pe latura de sud la începutul secolului 20, între anii 1905 și 1906, în intenția de a-l găzdui pe împăratul Franț Iosef al Austro-Ungariei. King Carol I wanted to impress and honor his neighbor, and so the room was built in the style of Franz Joseph's very own Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna. Lustra, cu forma unui coș de fructe, are deasupra montată o coroană care, bineînțeles, face trimitere la coroana imperială austriacă. Apartamentul imperial se compune din salonul mare, salonul mic decorat în stil neorococo austriac, din dormitorul împăratului, buduarul acestuia, baia și camera primului valet. King Carol I had created a structural masterpiece in the mountains. But on the 10th of October 1914, he died in his bedroom at Pelesh. His 48-year-long reign was over. Carol was succeeded by his nephew, 49-year-old Ferdinand I. Ferdinand was married to Princess Marie of Edinburgh, a granddaughter of Britain's Queen Victoria. Queen Marie of Romania was brought up in England. She was an incredibly popular woman. She was much loved by the people, and she was really very strong-willed. But Queen Marie was not a fan of her new home at Palais. She's mentioning in her memoir that she found the castle a little too cold and too dark and not so much connected to her personality, which was much more lighter and energetic, and she needed more space just for herself. She wanted her children to have a place where they are, first of all, children, and after that, prince and princesses. The new king and queen did not want Pelesh to be their home. They preferred the large mansion just a short distance away that had been built for them by King Carol. It was known as Pelesor, which means Little Pelesh. They saw it growing and, and becoming their own house. And that's the place where they had all their children and all their children um, grew up in that place. King Carol had insisted that the outside of Pelesor should be architecturally similar in style to its larger neighbor. The inside, however, was Marie's to play with. This is the jewel at the heart of Pelesor, known as the Gold Room. Sala aceasta este inspirată din curentul Art Nouveau. Pereții sunt acoperiți cu frunza de ciulin, care este simbolul heraldic al Scoției natale, dar în același timp simbolul orașului Nancy, acolo unde au fost puse bazele curentului Art Nouveau la sfârșitul secolului al XIX-lea. Piesele de mobilier care decorează această sală 
sunt sculptate în lemn de tei aurit. Regina avea o personalitate deschisă, luminoasă și așa se explică prezența aurului care acoperă atât stucatura pereților cât și piesele de mobilier. The Gold Room meant so much to Queen Marie that when she died in July 1938, her heart was placed in a casket and will forever remain in her favorite place. Ferdinand I became King of Romania in October 1914, two months after the outbreak of the First World War. Romania remained neutral until 1916, when the country joined the British and French in the fight against the so-called Central Powers. But during the conflict, Romania was under regular attack from its enemies, and for a time, Pelesh Castle became a headquarters for the German army. The royal family took refuge in Iași, in the uh, north part of the country. Pelesh was a castle in a war as well. Some areas were closed. We had the German soldiers around. Fortunately, there were not mass destructions during the war. It was not bombed or something. So it was also protected, but used as a military residence. As part of the treaties at the end of the war, the region of Transylvania was given to Romania. It was a significant achievement for King Ferdinand. Imagine how important was the impact of this uh, result of the war. Transylvania, which used to be part of Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and it's a large uh, area and rich area, is now integrated. So he's the king of the great Romania. He's the king of the country in the present day uh, state. It was here in one of the finest royal apartments at Pelesh that King Carol II, the eldest child of Ferdinand and Marie, was born. He came to the throne in 1930, at the start of a decade of turmoil in Europe. King Carol II, he was initially popular because he spoke Romanian as the first language, he'd been born in the country, but he had a very scandalous reign, a lot of affairs, and he became very unpopular due to what was seen as his debauchery. He was very, very intelligent and very erudite, which was quite unusual for a monarch, for a head of state in those days. But uh, he lived in the time of Stalin and Hitler. He couldn't have been Nelson Mandela. There was no time for that. And having Hitler on your left side and uh, Stalin on the right side uh, imposes a certain behavior. We are very comfortable today in the European Union to talk about values and shared values, but at the time, his counterparts were Mussolini, Hitler and Stalin. Quite a strange trio. King Carol II's autocratic reign ended in 1940, when Nazi Germany seized Romanian territory. Carol II abdicated uh, at the beginning of the Second World War. After Romania lost a part of Transylvania and the northern part of Romania as well, some historians consider that it was a tough decision and he felt guilty because he was not able to keep the state. Others consider that he didn't want to take the responsibility. An extremist government under General Marshal Ion Antonescu joined forces with Hitler. Then in 1944, with the Soviet army approaching, the Romanians switched sides and helped drive out the German forces. Michael I of Romania was the son of Carol II, so when Carol II had abdicated, Michael gave a lot of power to lead the war to General Antonescu, and throughout the war, the power of the Soviet Union really increased, and in 1945, the government instituted the communist government, which was very popular with the people. In 1948, the Communist Party temporarily shut Pelesh Castle to the public. They didn't knock it down because they didn't need to. They just closed it and that was all. They didn't have any appetite for this kind of symbols. 
They were very complex. The complex of inferiority was huge. I would say that Pelash became like a silent witness of the history of Romania under the communist regime. Because it's important to mention that the royal family disappeared from the textbooks. It was nothing mentioned about the kings and queens of Romania in the textbooks uh, in high schools or the university. As the regime became tougher, Pelish was shut off and became rather mothballed, which essentially was rather good for it. People just forgot about it. In the 1970s, the new communist president, Nicolae Ceausescu, recognized the value of Pelesh as a place to impress foreign dignitaries. He knew too that the castle was in need of restoration. With all this, Ceausescu, in the moment immediately anterior restaurations, a invitat la castelul Peleș pe președintele american Ford, care a ferit însoțit de secretarul de stat Henry Kissinger. Există fotografii cu cele trei personaje în holul de onoare. Cu ocazia vizitei de la Sinaia, Ford și Ceaușescu au încheiat un tratat economic uh, al națiunii cele mai favorizate, se numea. One month after the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, Nicolae Ceausescu's communist government also crumbled. After the Romanian Revolution of 1989, Pelesh Castle came back into the hands of government and it was opened and used for events and concerts and became a place of entertainment once more. When we read the journals of the time or newspapers of the time, we understand how people from all over Romania just came to visit. They are still coming, of course, to visit Pelesh, but the first year after the fall of communists saw an important number of Romanians who wanted to learn more about their history and their royal history as well. The castle finally came back to the royal family. The royal family no longer ruled Romania, but they were given back their title. And under part of those negotiations, they did get back some of their palaces, including Pelesh. In 1997, King Michael I, the son of Carol II, who had reigned before the communist era, was allowed to return to Romania. His Royal Highness, Prince Radu's father-in-law, had proved to be remarkably resilient. King Michael is probably, uh, could be in the Guinness Book of Records. He is probably the only king I know in history who managed to survive 90 years his own coronation. 90 years. Crowned at the age of six and died at the age of 96. Somebody who had to have lunch with Hitler and militated for NATO until the countries behind the Iron Curtain became NATO members, and then he went to eternity. It's quite, quite a number of models to, to follow. Today, the castle attracts over 400,000 visitors a year from all over the world. Pelesh was built as a new castle for a new country. What began as a project by a German-born ruler has been embraced as a truly Romanian treasure. It is interesting from my perspective as a historian to see that after a century and a half from the moment the castle was built, became really part of the Romanian civilization and the symbol of the Romanian history. The value of Pelesh is the identity of the place, the fact that it uh, incarnates a very important part of our sovereignty, of our history, of our politics, of our nation. That's perhaps why Romanians love Pelesh so much, because they see in it the reflection of their own statehood. And statehood is what we missed for 50 years. Mm -hmm.